Hello and welcome to Kingdom Stories. I'm Andrea and in this program I interview people to find out how they came to the faith, some things that God has done in their lives and what we can learn from people. My dad always says you can learn something from everybody even if it's just how not to be. So I love learning from other people and so Claude said well we should also get your testimony. So today Claude will be interviewing me and May may this be a blessing to you. Definitely. Shalom, guys. Andrea's testimony is actually a great testimony, a great testimony of how Yeshua can work in a woman's life and drive a woman to work for his kingdom as well. So let's get started. <laughs> Andrea, tell me how you became a believer of Yeshua. Well, I always grew up in the church, and I remember when I was little, we had to always go to church, and um, and then that faded, but that was good because we learned discipline, and when I was probably four years old, my mom asked me, do you want to give your life, do you want to give your heart to Jesus? And so I said, yes, I do, I do. So, you know, I grew up in the church, but then when I was in, in um, grade five, I was 11, a colleague of my mom said we should come to youth. So he was in the charismatic church and they had youth. And you know, this is for high school children. But he said, oh, you guys should come. So my sister and I went. I was 11. She was 10. And we get there and it's only high school people. And we feel so out because, you know, in, in that age, that's a massive age gap. And you're so self-conscious. And I remember that day he spoke about the rapture. And I remember he said that, you know, one will be standing by the mill and they'll be raptured and stuff. And um, and he said that whoever feels that it's um, too big of a moment can sit. But I was standing right in front and I didn't know everyone was sitting. So I stood. I was still standing. And at one point I looked over, everyone was sitting. And I was super embarrassed because you're so self-conscious that time. And I stood in the back of the church and this girl who... I don't think she saw what happened, but she came to me from from like the mother's room area. And she said to me, she was in grade 11, and she said, God will never leave you and he will never forsake you. And for some reason that just struck a chord and I started weeping. And then um, we did a sinner's prayer, which is interesting because I always... I was thought, oh, if you grow up Christian, then you're a Christian, you know. But it's of vital importance to have an experience with Yeshua. And so my mom, and I was still crying after that. And my aunt said, but it wasn't because I was so embarrassed. You know, that was because I was touched. And then my aunt um, said that that is the spirit. Because I grew up in like a church that didn't really know of the spirit. You know, I mean, they technically, theoretically do, but very little is really done. But my aunt has gone to churches where they learn more about the spirit. So, yes, so I would say that was where I really um, became a believer of Yeshua. And there I wanted to... I always wanted to live right, you know, because he's the king. Definitely. <laughs> and who are we? And so whenever I would read something in the scripture, I would do that. So there was a, the one um, encounter, but then, you know, sanctification is a process. And then as I started living more according to scripture, like I would read, I remember I read, if you find something that is not that does not belong to you and you do not know who it belongs to, then you can, you know, you can safeguard it, but you need to find the owner. And I was in school, in primary school, and I found a pen and I would have usually taken it. And then I thought, no, I'm going to leave it because maybe that person will come back for this pen because this is a nice pen. So I didn't take it. And, and I thought this would be theft if you took that. So, but as I started living according to scripture, I became, I came closer to Yeshua because that's how Yeshua lived. He lived according to scripture. Wow, okay. So that was a couple of years ago. So now, a few years after that, you've had a lot of experiences with Yeshua. Your relationship, your relationship has grown. So how would you describe your relationship with Yeshua now? So during all that, I started living more, you know, according to scripture. And I always knew, oh, he is a Messiah, you know. And then... One day you asked, I think you asked me, 
but is Yeshua your Messiah? And I was like, what does that mean? I said, everyone, peop- everyone always said, oh, but they love Yeshua. And then I always felt like I, I don't understand. I don't understand. <laughs> like you don't know this. You don't know him. You know, like like you can love. Like I can love my sister. I spend a lot of time with her and stuff. But you know, okay, he died for you. So what? He had to type of thing. It was so. It was so strange because I still lived according to scripture and, and I still wanted to live correctly, but I didn't feel um, particularly like I had a lot of love or whatever. But as as I as I walked um, in scripture, that grew. So the root word of love in in Hebrew is um, the word for love in Hebrew is ahava, and the root word is hav, which means to give. So there's a whole teaching of like love starts with giving, you know, and then that's why a mother nobody will love anyone more than a mother loves a child because that child doesn't do anything for you, but you do so much for this child, and as you do more, love grows. In any case. So, but then, um, after you asked, but is he your Messiah? I started pondering about that. Like, what does that mean? Why do people love him? And, um, and I started experiencing more of the spirit. I was filled with the spirit. I started speaking in tongues. And, um, and then I actually had an encounter with Yeshua. So I asked to, I, there's a whole thing like our father drew, drew me to come and say, Father, I want to see what's in my scroll. So there's um, some teachings. If you want to know more about that, let us know. Then we can we can teach on that. But I really felt urgently I needed to ask to see my scroll that day. And so I sat and I said, Father, I would really like to see my scroll. And then like I was taken like in, in the spirits to to a palace and so forth and I saw Yeshua and then he like had we had a whole conversation. And it was so it was so amazing because people say like if you have an encounter with Yeshua you will never come back. And I thought, have I ever had an account encounter with him? But now I can say definitely I have. And that was absolutely amazing. So now how would I describe my relationship with Yeshua now? I would say alive. Like previously, it wasn't alive, but I would say now it is alive. Awesome, definitely. So many people believe in Yeshua, but do not experience his healing. You have. Tell us about some miracles Yeshua did for you. So I was diagnosed with an autoimmune disease, and then um, and I took some pills for that, and it really made my life very difficult. And then I started being, I start in my spiritual journey, I started getting frustrated, like I wanted to know more about what does living in spirit and truth mean, and I started on that journey. And then I found out that I don't have to be sick, like, I don't have to be sick. So I just felt like, Father, I as your daughter, I request to not be sick <laughs> anymore. <laughs> and over time, like some when I was living in Stalys, a guy prayed for me and there, I could really see a massive difference. But then I came back and you guys prayed for me as well. And I'm released from that illness completely. And I used to wear glasses and my glasses were very expensive. They were like six and a half thousand rand three years ago. So I don't even know how much it would be now. So I just, I needed new glasses and I decided that I don't. <laughs> I just decided that I do not need that anymore. And I will, and I'm not going to pay 7,000 Rand or whatever it's going to be. I am healed because in Isaiah 53, it says yeah, three stripes, you're healed. Mm-hmm. So I just um, told my body, hey, listen, a new memo, you are healed. But also we prayed. I mean, there was a portion of a standing, but we also prayed. I'm healed. I don't need glasses anymore, which is fantastic. And I was, a father like gave me, I say father gave me, obviously somebody, but it was from father, this small Bible with very small print and so many people struggle to read it. Um, and I can read that easily. So, and I usually would get migraines if I didn't wear my glasses for 10 minutes. And then one day I was sitting at, in the sunroom. It was winter and I made extra piping hot coffee and I spilled that on my lap. But I was also wearing, I was wearing a dress and stockings and it was really the hottest I've ever had ever. And I was so like, 
I still chill. So I just like picked up my dress a bit. Then I realized, oh, you have stockings. This is going to make some some damage. So I went to my room. and But very chilled you know and then i you took the stockings off put some little bit of cold water on but i wasn't very committed to it when i sat in the sun room again i saw hold on this is probably like third degree burns this is very sore and because you know the adrenaline makes it not be sore at first but yes so i saw it, it was very red all over my thighs and and i just realized uh, no, <laughs> I mean, three stripes were healed. So I put my hands on that and I and I said, in Yeshua's name, I command you to be healed. Wouldn't go away. And immediately that, that sting, that like hotness went away, but it was still red. And I think, and then I just kept on reading because, you know, the pain wasn't there anymore. It was still red. And then after maybe 30 minutes, I looked again and it was completely not red anymore. There was no swelling, but there was a little, a small piece, maybe 10 of a, almost a 10 cent coin size. And I said, no, I want full healing. Thank you. So I said, in Yeshua's name, I command you to deal. And, and then later there was at another spot, there was a small bit and I thought I'm going to leave that as a testimony of what it could have been like. And that was there for a long, long time. So can you just, can you imagine? So that was so real of the the authority that we have in Yeshua's name. So I always, and, and linking to the, like what type of relationship to have with Yeshua now. I always thought, oh, we are, Yeshua means salvation. We don't have to go to hell anymore. But it's about more than that. It's about you have salvation from any demon, you know, any demon oppression and and like addiction and that type of stuff. You have salvation from illness. You have salvation from pain. Like, can you imagine what nonsense I could have had with those burns all over my legs and it was winter so I wouldn't have been able to wear pants at all so it's it's so so real and I praise father that I've had the opportunity to, opportunity to experience it and I'm looking forward to the depths that um, there is still to explore wow awesome praise Yeshua so that also shows us how real his stripes are the truth in that he did receive those stripes for us so we have a word called torah so we meet, we believe that is the first five books of the bible genesis exodus leviticus numbers and deuteronomy so you are a torah believer tell us what this means and when you bec- become one when you became one well, I always grew up in a house where my, my, I remember one day I by accident blasphemed and my mom said, oh, what? You need to, you need to ask for forgiveness right now because father says that you, he will not leave the one who blasphemes his name go unpunished. And I had such a massive fright. So I was just always thought that if it says so in the scripture, it says so in the scripture. But I still grew up in a church that taught you know different feasts as opposed to father's feasts and a different lifestyle than you find in scripture so then i was in grade six my sister was in grade five we were at my grand and then in the studio there was nothing to do so we just read scripture and so we read a lot and we got to matthew 28 after the crucifixion and it says after the sabbath when the sunday morning became light and we repeated it and we repeated it and repeated it and we looked at each other and we said i thought the sunday is the sabbath but this is what it says in scripture black on white and if you believe if if you think something that's contrary to scripture is scripture wrong or are you wrong but you know you're 12 years old but on earth do you do with that information so i asked a friend of mine that was very devout in her faith and i said this is what i found and she said well we're christians so we keep sunday and I just felt like that's not good enough. But then, Father, this was at the end of grade six, in the beginning of grade seven, Father moved us to Bloom. And here, he showed my grandmother about Shabbat and brought her to Al Shema, the group that we attended up until recently. And, well, I mean, I still go there. I still visit there. Um, but I'm more involved with Rafa now. But I learned so much in scripture there. And I saw 
that, hey, there's so much blessing in living according to the scripture. Why would you not want to? And then I had this a struggle because the church says you don't have to and th- this group says you have to so I said father show me um at my I remember when I was little my mom said in the sh- she spoke about you know the last days and tribulation and she said in the end even the very elect will be deceived and I thought that would be awful may I not be that so I thought how do you know your pastor isn't one of those people Because we, I mean, people have been believing this for ages, but we might be in the last days. And so my prayer has always been, Father, I don't want to be one of those people. Please don't let me follow those people. Even if I'm the only person in this world that does things correctly, um, I I would prefer to do that. So I reckon, hey, who knows best of what is correct and how he wants it than Elohim himself. And we have a direct line to him. Why not? So this was, I think, in great... 10 and I said father okay so the church says we shouldn't live according to these things that is in scripture and um, but it's in scripture I don't know like please open this for me and I've I literally immediately forgot it I think and but he was faithful and he showed me everywhere in the psalms everywhere in scripture he showed me how Yeshua walked according to the word and how we should live according to how the disciples lived my father posed a question where he said, if any group, there are so many, there's like 33,000 or how many groups, surely somebody is the closest to how father wants it. Who would that be in this whole world, in, in all of time? And he said, the disciples, because they lived with Yeshua for three years. And so in that time, I, I discovered how did the disciples live? And why would you not want to live like that? Do you believe that God is, a, is bad? Do you believe that he just wants to put a strong, a heavy yoke on you and, and, a, and a heavy burden? No. So anyway, so Father, open that to me. I started living according to the word more. I started committing to keeping Shabbat. And it has been such a wonderful blessing. I'm so grateful that I, that I made that decision. Wow, okay. The next question is a more personal one. There is a verse that says that Yeshua will bring a sword even among family. Is this true in your family? Yes. Well, when we started um, going to Al Shema, we started keeping Shabbat and the Torah. My mom thought we were in a cult. She said, this is going to be a Waco, Texas uh, situation. And and she would say, I remember one Shabbat, she said, go buy toilet paper, please. And my sister and I said, no, we will not. Uh, we mostly subscri- we subscribe um, to Father, so we will go off to sunset, or you're welcome to go, or we'll go tomorrow, but we will not. And praise Elohim, he brought them in, my mom and my dad, at the time, at a critical time. So we, when we started wanting to do kosher, they also, well, not do kosher, we wanted to uh, biblical kosher. It depends on how you define that word, you know, but uh, we started wanting, we wanted to eat the way that father instructs us to eat Um, but my parents were in at that time so there was no division in the house in that sense but there was massive fights with my aunts and them my uh my cousin said yeah you and your effed up religion but they weren't even there that time they didn't even didn't even know everything that they heard was hearsay but so we were extensively discussed we were asked to not go to my grandparents again like um on the other side my one on my one side praise elohim they they came in and they were um in the fullness of the word etc but they were not and so we were extensively discussed on that side but father brought them in as well so now they are also keeping shabbat they're living in the fullness of the word and i just praise elohim for that so i just want to encourage you do not don't get discouraged and in that in that time my my parents decided that yeshua is not the messiah my um, my mom got very confused uh, And with new age things and my dad became an atheist, he's still there. But my mom was brought back. Father heard our prayers and and he led me to do a fast. And he heard my cry. And my aunt also, like many people, fasted for her. So I want to encourage you. There are tools that you can use. Do not forget 
to use your tools and um, an imprint application. So um, anyway, so father brought my mother back and now there's, I just pray the limit, it's so cool. Awesome, wow. So with evangelism, you became very interest, interested in it. Why? Uh, so one day I prayed, because Yeshua says, pray that my father will send laborers into the field because the harvest is ready and the laborers are few. And I reckoned, oh, you know, why not? I mean, that can't do harm. And so I did that. And he says, so what's wrong with your hands? And I was like, ah, okay, good point. <laughs> I really did not want to be an evangelist. I did not want to be one of those strange people going to people and saying, hello, can I tell you about um, about Jesus? Can I pray for you? I did not want to be that person. I did not want to go live in a hut somewhere rural. And yeah, but then I believe after that, I started getting very bored and frustrated. Like I would go to service and I would come back and uh, like you like okay we live according to the word according to torah now you go to service and you come back i sleep and then that's it like is that the is that everything that it gets to surely there's more to it than this and i also really wanted to understand you know in john 4 yeshua says they will uh, they will I want to keep using afrikaans in my translations this is why i only read it from an english bible now um <laughs> So they will worship in spirit and truth. So I felt, okay, I have the truth bit down, but what is this? How do you worship in spirit? I wanted to learn more about that. And then Father just made things happen that I, that a friendship started between me and you and Shanae. And then I started coming to Rafa more. And you guys inspired me <laughs> with, your, um, with your involvement in the kingdom and so forth. So. But first, I didn't remember I didn't want to be involved in evangelism because I didn't want to be that strange person. And then Father moved me to Cape Town where nobody lived, well, nobody in my immediate vicinity. There was a fantastic community there, um, 30 minutes away that I later went into, but nobody at work. My flatmates did not follow what I did. So I had to, I really got to a point of, I do not care what you think about what I do. I don't, makes no difference to me. And then when, um, and then father moved me back to Bloom at the end of May. So I posted on the Rafa group, hey guys, I'm coming back to Bloom. And then, and then Claude and Shanae called me say so we um so you're coming back to bloom when you're coming back so i said at the end of may so they said well we're also coming back because father had taken had taken them to pe um and so they said well we're also coming back to bloom so i asked when are you guys coming back and they said at the end of may so i knew that this is an appointed time i'm sent back to bloom by elohim and that i needed to get involved in evangelism because this is a clear sign <laughs> so that's the story Okay, okay. So you obviously are a woman. Tell us about the challenges you experienced as a woman working in Yeshua's kingdom. Well, you know how people say women can't work in the kingdom, right? And then I and I just feel like that is a lie from the devil. Because say there are two billion people in the world, argument's sake. One billion women, one billion men. So, well, okay, no, let's say there are two billion Christians. One billion men, one billion women. So there are two billion people who can who can uh, minister to people, who can win souls. But now you say, a oh, women aren't allowed to do that. What nonsense. Like, that is something that the devil wants you to know. Now, I've come to a conclusion that women should work in the kingdom. I do not believe that women should shepherd a community. So because we had a, we kept wondering like, sh what is it? Like, are women allowed to, are we not? So we had a midrash. I think it's such a good idea. So as a community, we spoke about, we brought all our things to the table. And then there was said that women should have a ministry. You should teach, etc. But, you know, there's a certain way to go about it. And women should not shepherd a community. 
and but what if I'm an evangelist I go to some rural place there's no community and I create one who then has a should there not be a group so I really I went to father and I said I want to know I am angry about this and so he just like put this in my soul of uh what's a blonde put a vase he gave me like this vision this vision of a a, a beautiful blue, a white with blue flowers vase and he said that um you you can dig a hole with a vase but that's not what they were created for if you want a vase if you want a hole get a shovel so say i go to some rural place and i need to create a community like this is an emergency situation we're going to need to use a vase to move the soil but then let's find a shovel let's pray for a shovel and he also said why do you want that burden on your shoulders like and he just showed me like men's shoulders are a little broader for that like oxen are made for that bunnies are not made for, to put an ox wagon on you know we don't have bunny bunny wagons so <laughs> anyway so I find that that people say like how do you want to work in the kingdom not stop it with your nonsense in any way furthermore like I love it when things happen quickly man like I think you've experienced that I had like big dreams, let's make things happen. And um, I'm, I'm still learning how to navigate. I'm learning how to navigate being a woman in a position where I know what I'm doing and I need to like facilitate things. And then in my team, I have men who do not like that. But then I wonder if, if this was Yeshua that asked you to do this thing, how would you react? And are we not working in Yeshua's kingdom? Like, would you have just, like, how would your heart have been towards him? And why is your heart not like that now? Because are we not doing this for his kingdom? So, um, anyway, I'm still learning about about that. I believe that it will probably be a pretty long struggle. May it not be like that. My father, give me wisdom. <laughs> <laughs> Cool. <laughs> so you have gone out with us with evangelism trips and some of those places were dangerous. Some people told you not to go and be wise, you're a woman. Where other women did not want to go with us, you actually came. So you have gone into dangerous places for the gospel. Isn't it scary for you? So I just want to give context to the listeners. We went on an outreach to the township. We walked for 16 kilos into the township and then slept over there. We found a person of peace, slept over there in a shanty in the in the backyard. And then we walked back. Um, was I scared? No. Why, why should I be scared? I've never been. I, I'm not a scared person in general. Praise the Lord, I've always been safe physically. Like, Father's always kept me safe. I have no reason to think that I would not be. I was in one car accident. And the way that Father just made that happen, um, the the person who drove into me was my grandparents' neighbor. And then he said, I will pay for everything. You don't have to worry. And anyway, so that's the only, like, kind of physical bad thing that has happened. But And there was no damage to my body. So, I uh, no. You are working in Father's kingdom. Yeshua is with you. And also, I had you and Dean were with me, so I knew that I would be fine. I didn't feel like I had any reason to be scared. Okay. I know it was... For me, I think it would have been difficult. <laughs> because how do you go to the toilet? Or where do you sleep? Oh, yeah, that or... was difficult. Yeah, that was a challenge. Because, oh, my word. So, we... Um, they gave... They had a, a double bed and a single bed. So obviously Dean and Claude took the double bed and then I took the single like mattress on the floor, which was very cold. But they were such gentlemen, like they gave me the warm um, sleeping bags and like all sorts of bl blankets. Like they took some of theirs to give it to me. So you guys were such gentlemen. But then <sighs> the loo situation. So there was a bucket that I, I I never had to do this before in my life. So, but there's one, sh there's like one shanty with literally a, a, a very shy, obviously, and um, and there was a 
like a curtain, I would say, that divides the two rooms. So then um, I was, I had massive stage fright because so I was in the one room with the bucket and you guys stood like by the door, like, but talking to each other so that you can, um, I don't know, not make things awkward. But yeah, so that was, that was, a, that was a big challenge. We, I remember we actually had to hold the door shut because the people outside wanted to co come in because some of their stuff, <laughs> some of their stuff were placed inside. So we actually held the door shut. We, you you were behind this curtain on a piece of like drum. Yeah, literally a drum. A drum. But let's not go into much detail there. But because of this, um, this, this bravado or this eagerness and this willingness to do things that other people would find maybe scary this has led you into a, a, a big sphere of how you how you do do evangelism uh, uh, a variety of to tools you've learned or uh, learned to use a variety of skills you've you've gained you do evangelism on on the computer on facebook on whatsapp even on the radio program you you cover a, a huge skill set on the radio program and even in your life as you evangelize and you go go with us on the streets into the streets as well so with this what kind of miracles have you seen have you uh, let me let me say have you seen miracles happen when you prayed for it yeah we went um because father brought us back and i wanted to be more involved in evangelism so i remember one day we went to a square not not a square like it is literally the square uh, where there are lots of shops and we were looking for people who seemed like they had pain so we prayed for one guy who had kidney problems now we were praying for something else actually but then he came back and he said he had kidney problems that was healed because it was always really sore for him to go to the loo and now it's not anymore so that was fantastic and a gentleman that had back pain for two weeks that was healed and my grandfather's one leg was shorter than the other one which made him walk strange and he had um you know that leads to back pain and to hip pain and all sorts of things and we prayed for him his leg grew out and then he had much less pain there and then also we when we were at that square we found this lady who was walking cripple because Claude said let's find someone who like looks like they're cripple so we go and I see this lady who is walking cripple so we go to her and we say hi the kingdom of God has come close to you today is there anything that we can pray for you for at home do you have any pain and she says yes my back is or well, her hips or something and um and her husband is and her husband says we were just at church and I'm like that's fantastic sir can we pray for your wife and he says um and she says yes yes let them pray for me so we we prayed but you could see he was extremely uncomfortable so he was it turns out he's a pastor at the church that they were at that day he spoke about healing and but now, you know, it's after the church, they come to do their shopping. So now, obviously, some of these community people are going to be there. What are people going to think about these young people praying for his wife? So I think Father has such a sense of humor. But um, yeah, so that lady's leg who was also shorter than the other one. It grew out in front of our eyes. So I've, I once saw this expose day on faith healers. And they say that people like pull the shoe off the person's foot so then it looks like they were healed we don't do that we take your shoes off because we want to see what's really happening so we could see that her leg came out and her husband was extremely uncomfortable the whole time but she was healed she didn't walk cripple anymore her pain was absolutely gone so that was pretty cool awesome awesome so andrea what is the one thing you would want everybody to know god does not change God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. People change, but He does not. Awesome, and that is so true. That is why we experience the things we do, and that is why Yeshua is still in our lives today. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So this is the end of my questions. Cool, Claude, thank you so much for taking the time to interview me, and thank you so much for listening all the way through. I hope that this blesses you, and um, may you be inspired, and... Yeah, shalom, shalom. Shalom.